welcome to Furious Driving. And if you've been wondering where all the beige in the world had gone, well, it's here. I'm sat in it. This is the beigest lump of beige you're ever going to see. This is a Volvo 460 GLE automatic in champagne gold with a beige interior, beige carpets, beige dashboard. I think even the engine is beige on this car. Let's take a look around this, the replacement for the Volvo 300 series, and see if we can avoid finishing the review wearing elasticated slacks and comfortable shoes bought from the back pages of the Daily Mail. Now a quick word from our sponsors while you hit like and subscribe, and then on with the review. Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. And Lancaster Insurance cover the Furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description below. So this is the Volvo 400, in this case a 460 GLE. The 400 range was dreamt up in the late 70s to replace the 300 series, which kind of makes sense. In 1978 when work started on this, the 300 was already looking a little bit dated, and this was scheduled to be released in the early 1980s. And so, in 1978, a project called Galaxy Project, or Project Galaxy, was dreamt up to bring up two new vehicles, codenamed G1 and G2, which were going to be the 400 and the 800, the small and the large car ranges taking Volvo into the 1980s. Now, although the design of the 400 series is credited to Peter van Kolenberg, in 1980, the first proper design concept car of this model was released and that came from Jans Vilgaard, a name who I'm sure you're very familiar with because he designed pretty much everything Volvo from the time of the dinosaurs until the time of, well, Concord. And things were going well. They had three model lines lined up, the 440, the 460 and the 480. The G13, which is the 480, the Halo model coupe, the G14, which is this, the 460, and the G15, which is the 440. But in 1982, there was a change of direction. And the project was handed over or signed over, some people say it was sold to uh, Volvo Cars BV, which is the former DAF operation, and they took over development. And like the 300 before it, which had been initially a DAF car before Volvo bought into the company, this became one of the Netherlands Volvos. This is all hunky-dory, very peachy and everything, except of course they didn't really have the manpower that they had in Sweden. And so things slowed down. A lot of the work had to be subcontracted out. Two English companies were doing work for them, so parts of the project were going back and forth across the channel. Meanwhile, as much work as they could was being done in-house in the Netherlands. And so when the car was eventually born, uh, see what I did there, it was born out of the factory in the Netherlands in 1988. This was a full decade after the project was incepted, which is a very long gestation period for any kind of car, often it's half that. And so the car was very, very delayed. Let's take a little look around the outside of the car and see what we think of it. So what do you think? It really is from the good old days of Volvo's design it with a set square and a steel rule school of art. There are some curves in it, like on the 700. You'll notice as you look around, there actually are a few curves hidden amongst all of the angles. But the thing is by 1988, when the car actually came out, it did look a little bit dated, unfortunately. However, looking at the front of the car, you can see the family resemblance where, and this is actually mentioned in the press pack for the thing. It's got the same vertical stripes as on the 700 complete with the big square lights and the ginger caters on the corner. So you can see the family resemblance between the 400 and the 700. When it was facelifted a couple of years later, they changed the front end to a body color surround for this and more integrated lights and lamps. So it looked a lot more like the 800, which was the other Project Galaxy car. And there were three body styles as well. There was the 440, which is the five door hatchback. There was the 460, which is this, the four door saloon. And there was the 480, which is the two door coupe, or three door coupe. And this car being a 1991 460 GLE automatic in gold with a beige interior, I'm gonna suggest it was bought by a fairly elderly demographic owner because you don't get much more elderly demographic owner in 1991 than a gold automatic saloon from Volvo, do you? 
There are also three trim slash power levels, the GLE being the one that fits in the middle, so it's very well equipped. All the cars, even the base model, the GL, was well equipped for the price and the category. They were actually pitching it against the Sierra, even though it's quite a bit smaller than a Sierra in reality, and the boot is a lot smaller than a Sierra's. However, the equipment levels were very good indeed. Electric sunroof, electric windows, electric mirrors, all that kind of stuff. That was pretty good going in 1991. However, they released the 480 first of all, which is a typical Volvo thing to do. You release the highest spec, most niche, most expensive and lowest volume first in order to iron out all of the niggles that come with a new model. And there were quite a few niggles with the new model, so it's lucky they did. So by the time they got to volume production with the 440 and the 460, they kind of knew what they were doing. But looking around the 460, you can see yet more Volvo styling traditions. Apart from the fact we've got hubcaps here, very straight edges, big mirrors, strong A-post. They mentioned in the press pack that the roof is strong enough to stand the car's weight on. So if it rolls over, it's going to be straight. Very vertical windows, so lots of elbow room, so it feels big and airy inside. You'll notice on the saloon version here, there's big step up onto the boot lid as well. So, so you have a low shoulder line down here under the windows, big glass area. If the boot line carried on to just here, it would look ridiculous. So stepping up, like on a BMW M3 E30, for example, um, we've got this big chunky boot, gives us a bit more boot volume than it would otherwise do. Also got mud flaps, but I think those are optional. Around the back of the car, it's still very, very angular. It does look a little bit like a small version of the 700, which was pitched at, as I say later on, the 850, 800 series, which was its co-conspirator in production and development, has got a very similar back end to this, and they became more and more like each other in styling as facelifts went on. But anyway, around the back, huge Volvo logo, got our name GLE and injection, because that was quite a big thing in 1991, as was the catalyzer. This was huge. We've also, from the factory, got a heck blend. Okay, it's not a full heck blend because we've got the number plate in the middle. A full heck blend would be red reflectors all the way across. But this is such a cool 1980s thing with the recessed number plate plinth with the reflectors and stuff built into it. Very, very cool indeed. It's also the original Bishops of Brighton number plate. Interestingly, my Volvo 740 came from the Volvo dealer in Horsham, which is in the same county as Brighton, both in Sussex. My car being a 1988 E-plate, these cars would have been fairly close to each other almost their entire lives which is quite interesting. Well, I think it's interesting anyway. Also looking back here, you'll notice in front of the big speakers, we've actually got folding rear seats, which are not all the competitors in this category would have had. So that's a nice touch. Now here under the bonnet, it's probably not a massive surprise to learn there's an engine. It's a fairly traditional place to put it. This though, in this transversely mounted front wheel drive application, which was fairly unusual for Volvo at the time, because I think I'm right in saying that everything from Volvo up until that point had been rear wheel drive. Even the Volvo 340 with its clever transaxle and the CVT gearbox was front engined and longitudinal. This though is front wheel drive sideways mounted. The thing is though, this is quite a little engine. There's a lot of space around it in this engine bay. So you think they can maybe fit in their big red block two litre, but no, this is the 1.7 from Renault. DAF Volvo Car BV's predecessor in name and spirit had had previous times, the 55 and 66, had used Renault engines as well, going back to the 1960s. It's not a big surprise, I went back to their longtime partner and found a 1.7 litre to pop in here. There were three versions of tune on it. This is the middle one, and the top one had a turbo on it, which made it an entirely different animal in completely. One thing that is quite interesting is this huge area at the front where the radiator sits, like on an American car of the, the 60s, 50s, 70s, we've got this massive space, this big overhang in front of the front bulkhead. The radiator itself is actually tiny, but we've got this huge area down here. So much room for activities. I don't know what they were thinking. Maybe they were thinking of a rear-wheel drive version at some point or an all-wheel drive. I don't know. There's room for it if you wanted to do it. But worth noting while you're looking underneath here, this is Volvo electronic fuel injection. On the 740, it's the two litre engine, but it's mechanical Bosch K-Jetronic fuel injection on the bigger engine. So this is a little bit more accurate. That's why it's got the Lambda sensor badge on the boot. I know this isn't the most significant design feature, but I always am fascinated by these huge windscreen washer turrets that tower out of this scuttle area on some Volvos. Right, so let's get the 460 back on the road and tell you what it's like to actually drive the thing. Well, I can tell you acceleration is not meteoric, but then I don't think you were really expecting that anyway, were you? The brakes are quite effective and it does stand the car down on its nose quite firmly and the car rolls in 
into corners in a relaxing manner. I say relaxing. If you're going slowly, it's relaxing. If you're going more than about 35 or 40, it's less relaxing. And although there was a five-speed manual gearbox available, which I suspect, which I suspect is probably quite a nice thing to use, this car has the automatic option, but it's not the CVT which had been available on the 300. They hadn't been able to make that work properly with this engine. Later on in the car's life, they did bring out a 1.8, which they managed to make a metal banded rather than rubber banded CVT work on. But this is a four speed ZF Slosh-O-Matic, and it does do a job of slurring between the gears and doing its very best to hinder any performance that may have been garnered from the 1.7 litre. And it does, when you're waiting at a junction, you normally put it into, into neutral or park if you're gonna be there more than a few seconds. It does rattle like a Massey Ferguson with a broken flywheel. I don't know if that's standard or not. I suspect it isn't. And the big question is, does it feel like a Volvo? Because the original Volvo 300s really didn't feel very Volvo-like, but they became more volvo -y as they went along. This does feel like a Volvo of the 80s because it does have that certain heavy, solid feel that you associate with their cars. And for such a small car, considering it's somewhere between an Escort and a Sierra in terms of size, it does have a very heavy feel. The steering is quite heavy and ponderous. Yeah, the steering is quite an interesting factor of this car. It really is one of the most important things in terms of giving a car character, because that's what you've got your hands on all the time, the steering wheel. And it turns in with a certain heavy weight, and there is a certain element of understeer as you hit the faster corners. So all told, it really is a car that rewards a relaxed driving style. It's not a car you're gonna get into if you're looking forward to an exciting, Stay on a B road, it's probably not something you would immediately leap to if you're going to the Nürburgring. But something that doesn't feel quite as Volvo-ish as the 200 or even the 700 is the interior build quality. It doesn't feel quite as solid as the big saloons did. Certainly it looks it, it just doesn't have quite the same strength of plastic. Oh, lovely little Honda. Yeah, it does, it does like to vibrate when you're at rest. Even in neutral, this entire dashboard area has a bit of a shake going on. Now, I don't know if this is down to this individual car or if they all do this, but as there's only about four left, it's kind of hard to judge. This is a car that does have incredible rarity value. I mean, when did you last see a Volvo 400 of any ilk on the road? There really aren't many around anymore. Another Festival of the Unexceptional Radwood contender for turning up and being fairly unique on the green. Looking at them now, they do have a wonderful square edge 1980s angularity, which you just don't see anymore. And things like the Hyundai Ionic really do capture with their kind of curious edges. And this does fire up the old reminiscence glands no end. And looking at this, you get a warm fuzzy feeling. But at the time, it was considered to look a little bit old fashioned and a bit fuddy duddy. And this car has been lent to me by Joseph of Lloyd's Vehicle Consulting. If you check out his channel below, you'll see a lot more videos about this particular vehicle and his experiences with it. And he's taken a fair bit of work to get it to its nice drivable condition it's in today. Now I've actually really quite enjoyed this. There are certain elements of my 740 in this 460. Now that front grille just makes them look so much of the same family. The heavy feeling of the car as a whole do make them feel very related as well. However, the 740 with its rear wheel drive and much more heavily assisted steering feels actually like a slightly more nimble and chuckable car than the 400, which is, which is quite curious, I find. The bigger, older rear wheel drive car is the more of the rally car. But that's not to say this isn't fun, and certainly if you're looking for a car with curiosity value to it, then this is uh, certainly one that can be right up your street. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this incredible 
monument to and of beige. The beige life lives. I do feel like I need to go and buy some comfortable slacks right now. I actually do have a Panama hat in the car, which I'm going to be wearing on the way home. So yeah, this thing may have affected me slightly. If you've enjoyed this, please always hit like and subscribe and join us next time driving something completely different. Mm -hmm.